Welcome to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. With me today are Louis D'Souza and Anne-Marie Young. This is your Daily Dose of Happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Now, I do have a special reason to be happy today because I finally tested negative for COVID yesterday after 12 days of dealing with this nightmare of a thing. So, hooray, finally got past that. Now I just need to get the energy back. But, you know, one step at a time, you know, good progress. I'll go with the good progress. That's all that I really want at this point. Just feel better, feel better. And uh, toward that end, we also have a guest joining us today who's all about feeling better, which is this is going to be a good mix because, of course, we're about your daily dose of happy. And he's all about living a happier life. I, I don't think we're going to have any trouble finding anything to talk about here today. I mean, that, that's just a guess. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like a you know throwing a dart out in the darkness, but uh, I, I think it's going to work out well. So, t- Tom Glazer, thank you for joining us on the show today. How are you doing? Pleasure to be here. I'm well. No COVID to report here. So that's great. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, it, well, you know, most of us uh, are very happy when we, when we put that behind us because it's, yes. yeah, it's not fun. It's not fun, but it's behind me. Yay. I like that. I have, I have to say though, well, when I, when I got it, both times I've had it, it's been nice to just sit back and do nothing and watch telly. <laughs> <laughs> There's always a bright side, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, every course. cloud. <laughs> Absolutely. It's true. It's true. It's true. So, um, Tell us a little bit, bit about yourself there, Tom. Um, I know that uh, you, you had, like so many people, you had your really bad dark night of the soul, and that inspired you. But tell us how all that came together. Yeah, well, I'll start, again, by thanking you so much. It's a, such a pleasure to be here. Uh, gosh, I'm a dog lover. I am a gardener. I, um, I live in Minneapolis most of the time, but I spend as much time in Southern California as possible. So I'll be heading there soon for the season. So that's good news. Oh, and next week, get this, I am taking a week for a a yoga retreat in Costa Rica on the beach. So I got a lot to look forward to here. Yeah. For for work, I'm I'm a strength, I'm a licensed psychologist, which I've been doing my whole career. And, um, I'm an author as well and uh, educator. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that dark night of the soul. So I had my dream job. I um, couldn't wait to wake up every morning and go to work. And I was planning to retire at this job. I was a senior counseling psychologist at a small college. So I got to do the individual psychotherapy that I adore and I got to teach as well and um, teach about wellness promotion activities. And there's all room, kinds of room for creativity. And I got to train the orientation leaders and the resident advisors. It was like, this was just a, a job like designed for me. I was on fire and uh, things changed dramatically after about seven years when a new coworker showed up who despised me. She, this person just could not stand me. And I tried everything I could to make it work. And we were a very small staff. We were assigned together to work on those wellness promotion activities. Mm -hmm. We couldn't avoid each other and nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. And the truth is I got depressed because I was losing uh, what was formerly just uh, my joy. In the midst of my depression, I noticed really happy people all around me, ordinary people, just like you and me, not celebrities, not millionaires, not billionaires, just ordinary people, like the person who had an office next door to me in my private practice, to somebody I was in a play with, to the guy who cuts my hair. And um, I just started noticing, what are they doing that, that I'm not doing? Or, or what are they not doing that I'm doing? And then I got braver and I started asking them questions. Well, it just snowballed into this um, project. I started with when I call mini documentaries, I, I interviewed them on camera, nine of the happiest people I personally know. And I had known for years that I would write a book one day, but I didn't know what it was going to be about um, until a break in filming that first day. And I walk out on the back porch and um, in the sunshine and I go, oh, my gosh, this is what I'm I'm going to write my book about because I'm on fire today. Uh, sitting with happier people talking about what makes them tick just brought me alive. And um, yeah, that's how the book 
was born. So I'll, I'll pause there and then, cause then there's, there's, there's more to say, but let me check in. How, what? <laughs> well, it, it sounds like the same kind of story that lots of people experience. There, there's the crash, there's the discovery, you know, now that I know what I don't want, what do I want instead? Finding what you want instead, looking into it, learning about it, realizing, wow, I got to share this with the world. And then the upswoop. And, exactly. and you, you've gone through the exact same thing. Yeah. That's what we seem to be doing our best learning, I think. Right. Right. And making lemonade from lemons kind of mm-hmm. thing. Right here I was in the situation that I did not anticipate. And um, it catapulted me into a whole other phase of life, which has been good in so many ways. That's terrific. Now, give us some of the um, the the little tips that you picked up along the way. What are some yeah. of the, the the best ideas you picked up in terms of how to turn things around when you're feeling so down? You got it. So, what I noticed. So, first of all, when I first started writing, I assumed I would devote a chapter to participant. But I realized really quickly they were saying so many of the same things that that's format wasn't going to work. So instead, uh, the book is topical. So there's all kinds of things like um, being true to yourself, living in alignment with your values, uh, practicing gratitude, taking really good care of yourself. Um, so there's all kinds of things. And there are three or four, depending on how you count it, uh, key things that I learned by far that happier people do. And those are number one, they connect with others. And all these are about connection, by the way. So that's, that's the common denominator is connecting. So have your people connect with other people. They have a tribe. They have people they love and who love them in return. And they spend a ton of time with them. And they are accepted, warts and all. Number two, have your people connect with themselves. They know who they are. They uh, honor their rhythms. They're mindful. They're in the present moment. All these things incorporate connecting with the self. They're not distracted by fears of what's to come or memories of what happened before. They're in the present moment so they can soak in all the precious, preciousness of what's happening in the here and now. Uh, number three, happier people connect with their passions. They do things they adore. They do activities that bring them into that flow state where they lose all sense of time. And they do a lot of them. So when we do any or all of those, connecting with others, self and passions, in the service of others, when we're working toward bringing about a greater good for all, and for others, that's when I just see the holy grail, right? That's like when it all comes together. That sounds good. In fact, you, you named a, a, a few of my favorite things there. When you start off, especially with their connections to other people, I mean, Louie and Amarino, I, I, I like to talk about that a lot. And I like to reference a study. I'm not sure if you're aware of this one. You might be. Um, this is a study that was conducted by Sean Aker, who's one of the leading spokesmen of the positive psychology movement. Um, it was based on uh, work that he did at Harvard when he was trying to identify what it would take for the highly stressed students at Harvard to calm down, feel better, and realize this is what it's going to take for me to be successful in life. He wanted to identify what, how, how do you know when someone's going to be successful? And so he did this huge study. I think like one-fifth of the entire school took the study. I mean, it was a really big study. And when all was said and done, he couldn't find any correlations except for one. And it was the last question that he threw on at the last second, which was about social connections. Mm. And what he discovered was that the correlation between social connectedness and success in whatever it is you want to be successful in life is 0.7. And I'm sure you know the statistics well enough to know that's a pretty high correlation. So, yeah, I don't know if you're aware of that study, but I, I just love that one. The, thing, the only thing I don't like about that study is no one knows about it. I seem to be the only one. So, um, yes, I thank you for saying that because I was almost embarrassed to admit, no, I don't know that, but thank you. <laughs> the the, the only the reason one. I know about it, the only reason I know about it, was Sean put out the book many years ago called The Happiness Advantage. And part of his book tour, he was on PBS doing a special, presenting his book. And after he had presented the book, it was like an appendix at the end where he was just doing a little audience interaction. And that's where he mentions it. It's not mentioned in the book. It's not mentioned in any of his following books. It's only mentioned in that special. And I'm thinking, John, what are you doing? You gotta, you gotta broadcast that one to the world. <laughs> You're doing it for him, Walt. Good job. I'm trying. I'm trying very hard. Yeah. 
because I think it's so freaking important. It's essential. Uh, we, as as much as air or water, we are social beings. We're mammals. We've got to have people. We've got to have our peeps. Yes. Yeah. No doubt about it. No doubt at all. And then, of course, you follow that up with how you feel about yourself. That, that to me, is the holy grail right there. Social connections and how you feel about yourself. Your connections to others and your connections to yourself. Well, right. and you have to have one to have the other, right? And it's the chicken or the egg. Mm-hmm. Right. And in fact, I've talked about this with a lot of people. We we've, we've tried to explore which comes first. Is it connection with others or is it connection with yourself? And an argument could be made for both. But the truth is, right, when we're born, we have to be connected immediately. Right. I mean, how, how do you find out who you are except through in relationship to other people? Right. We have to start by a solid connection with a caregiver to thrive. But it, but we never lose it. It's not like we only need it for the first few months or years of our life. We we need no, it throughout the lifespan. And like Absolutely. you say, they feed each other. They they both. I mean, oh. when you when you build one, the other one grows. When you build the other one, the first one grows. I mean, they it, yes. they they're they're almost inseparable, really. Absolutely, it's through my relationships with others that I learn who I am and how I impact people, and vice versa. Which it certainly makes sense to me from a, a spiritual perspective. I'm one who believes in us all being part of source energy. So if we're all connected in that way, then yeah, of course. I mean, of that's course. where the power comes from. It comes from those connections that we all have. Of so, course. Yeah. Yes. So good stuff there. So Louis and Anne Marie, I, I've been uh, dominating things as I usually do for the first quarter of the show, <laughs> but I want to bring you guys in. So I'll go to you, Anne Marie, first. What, what are you thinking about when you're hearing what Tom and I are talking about? Well, it just makes sense to me because it's like you say, when you're born, your brain needs that interaction to develop. It needs that nurturing. And as we go through life, I don't think we ever really grow up. We still need that. And um, I certainly find when I'm social, I'm happier. Yeah, this is true. For sure. Yeah. Mm. When, When you feel disconnected you usually also feel disconnected from others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, because I tend to hide away. I'll just hide away if I'm not feeling connected to myself or I'm not having a good day. I'll just go and hide away, which isn't a bad thing all the time. No. But as long as you're not doing it all the time. No. And 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 speaking of not doing it at all, I, mean, I, I can't imagine Louis not being connected. I mean, he's always connected as far as mm-hmm. I'm, I'm aware. I mean, maybe there are times when he's not, but I'm pretty sure he is. But uh, Louis will have to clue us in on that. So, Louis, what, what are you thinking about here? I was just remembering a friend of mine. Um, he stayed with me in my, my house for a while, a South African friend was living with me in London. And he, he got really depressed and frustrated and all the rest of it. And then he got much, much better. And I said, and what did you do? He said, I started socially interacting. Because he was a computer programmer. I think you might relate to that. Oh, yes. <laughs> you can get lost <laughs> doing soon, that. <laughs> as soon as he started relating to other people, and he also cut off, cut out sugar. And mm-hmm. so the two things made a massive difference in his life. And this was many years ago, like 25, six years, no, 20, maybe, yeah, 25 years ago. Um, he, he, he worked this all out for himself. So um, it left quite a, a stark impression about how much he was saying, you know, that social interaction was making him feel so much better than he did. But the thing that I'm into at the moment is it's very much the connection of everything. Like we're connected to soil and, you know, going back to my old story that if all the insects died, humans would die in 20 years. There wouldn't be a human left if all the worms died in the world. Five years before all the humans are dead. If all the humans died in the world, the world would thrive. So, you know, humans really need to start appreciating. And I think even the COB um, uh, environmental in Egypt thing that's on at the moment, they're just saying we're in really dire straits now more than we've ever been in so many different directions. And I personally have seen that drastically. And they say we're, we're, we're fighting this battle, but we're losing it. We're really losing it. And I know, I know your opinion, Walt, but... Um, uh, I've just seen this. <laughs> um, you know, I've also seen on the other side of that so many people on so many different walks of life with so many different methods of healing the planet in their own way. 
And, you know, it's gargantuous how big that movement is. And there are so many people. And I'm really enjoying being part of all those uh, people at the moment. But the thing I'm really wanting to talk about is, is I'm really feeling so connected to the trees, to the sun. You know, if there wasn't sun, there wouldn't be um, photosynthesis. If there wasn't photosynthesis, there wouldn't be flowers, you know. And, you know, the whole thing is a cycle and you totally reliant as humans. I mean, the rest don't seem to be as reliant, but humans, we're so reliant on everything around us. And um, I think we're coming to a very interesting place at the moment. I'm very curious how the humans are going to deal with this one. Um, very, very interested. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even sure how to answer at that point. <laughs> well, I just, I love this idea that we're all connected to everything, including the insects and the worms. And that, that is very much in line with connection uh, with others and self. So, so I mentioned, I think I named it as mindfulness when I talked about connection to self. Maybe I did not, but uh, uh, mindfulness and gratitude, right? helps us do the kinds of things that you're suggesting, Louis, right? To really wake up and notice the fact that we are reliant. Like if we're really mindful as we eat, we would be honoring the kinds of things you just mentioned, that that there was a farmer, that there was someone who transported this, there was a grocer. Before that, there was the soil and the insects and the worms. Yes, I mm. love this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the idea of thinking of the human body as an accumulation of soil. Another way of looking at it is, is part of mother, mother earth. We're just part of mother earth mm -hmm. and we will go back to mother earth. And that's where in, in the meantime, you know, we're talking about enlightenment or, or consciousness or awareness etc and you know when the gurus go and they get enlightened you know the common story that comes out of it all is unity with the all you know realizing truly knowing completely that we were part of the all and um you know there's a lot of the all that we aren't respecting at the moment in massive ways and we've been doing it for so long that you know, thing, things are going to start affecting us, I think, in a lot more different ways than we've ever dreamt. And it's one thing I came across recently was the level of infertility is massive. You know, and one in four people have to have um, uh, fertility drugs, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, that's, you know, may, maybe, what's his name? Who's, who's, who's the guy who's got Tesla? Musk. Oh, Elon Musk. Musk. Elon yeah. Musk. Yeah. He was saying one of the big problems is we really need to have more people on this earth, not less. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, you can start seeing, you know, the huge loss of people in China. Um, and now they've taken away the rule that you can only have two kids or whatever. Now you can have as many as you want, but it's so ingrained in their psyche. They don't want to have any more kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think India is the one country that's really increasing their, their population massively. <laughs> um, but the rest of the world has stabilized. A lot of them have, have stabilized or cut, cut them down. But, you know, it, it's just really interesting. I'm just looking at all the things that are going on around at the moment. And um, I'm just thinking there's such challenging times ahead of us. And I'm really wondering um, how we're all going to deal with it and how we're going to come, come out of it. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's a journey and, you know, there's no time period on this planet that, that the people of the time have not had some extreme or very difficult challenges to deal with. And, um, you know, I've always believed that, that, you know, there's no such thing as negativity, only expansion points. So, um, you know, there, there is the question if we will be alive to expand, but we might be able to take another body or something. I don't know, but. <laughs> Um, you know, well, I'm really, really watching so many different aspects of what's going on at the moment. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've joined a, a group called Rotary International. You might know it. And we, we had 70 people we gave a dinner to. So we picked up all these old people all over the place, um, and took them there. We gave them a meal. We gave them, um, 
we gave them music, dancing, you know, live music, et cetera, uh, you know, three course meal, uh, for, for so many people. And, you know, it was such a fun event with the, the thing of the, the guys that I picked up and, you know, all of them were so grateful. And they were, they were, one of the big things that they were saying is loneliness. Mm. You know, this is what I wanted to bring in. You know, they were saying, you know, we're so lonely and I look forward to this event every year, you know. <laughs> And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who, who aren't connected. They're very lonely. And the Western society doesn't look after the old people very well at all. We expect insurance and policies and all the rest of it to look after them. Where in, in Africa and South Africa was brought up there, the, the, the native tribes there were, were based on, I want to have lots of children because the children look after me when I'm old. I don't have a lot of children. I won't get looked after. So, you know, and that, that creates a whole family unity, which is completely obliterated in this day and age, um, in the West. So, you know, it's really interesting. I'm just watching all the different factors going on at the moment. Um, and it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. And, uh, how many people, you know, just like Rotary is one of the third biggest, um, charity organizations in the world that doesn't take any money to look after it. You actually have to pay to be a member. Um, and you've got, this, this is just one, you know, just one of the tiny <coughs> things. When, when we sit in the meeting there and they, they tell you all the things that they've done, even now, just our club, you know, we, we brought in in two weeks, 10,000 pounds for Ukraine. Um, you know, and, but there's so many different people on different levels that they're helping. And this is just one organization. Then I'm also part of the Save Soil movement and they're hugely invested at the moment on, on a massive scale. They've already, um, they've already targeted 3.8 billion people. Um, which is massive. It's probably the biggest, the biggest by, bar none, um, event that's taken place on this planet so far. Um, just helping people appreciate soil and understand that, you know, um, soil is our life. Our body's made of soil. And if, and if it's uh, decreasing in its quality, etc., then the humans are going to decrease in their strength and their, their resistance. So, you know, if, you, if you're going to have poison food, etc., all the time, you know, what, one, one dose of Roundup kills 50% of the worms, for example. Mm. And you know how many doses they put on the farm. And, you know, if you go to many of these huge industrial farms and you put your fork in the ground, you just break your fork. You know, it's so hard. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even the fertilizers these days aren't coping that well. But, you know, there, there's so many solutions to it all. And they've all got all these solutions and people are starting to use them. And, and especially in America, because <laughs> your food, by the sounds of it on a global scale, sounds quite bad out there. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to Europe, etc., um, you know, you, you've been far more liberal with your fertilizers and your poisons than a lot of the rest of the world. So, you know, e, yeah, I mean, looking at the Netherlands, they've done one of the best jobs with the whole um, soil, etc., um, of, of almost any country. And one of the reasons for that is they they had to <laughs> they had to get rid of the sea to make land so that they can grow things. So they had to make sure that whatever they were putting down there could grow um, because they, they literally reclaimed a lot of sea. So they, they've got a huge amount of knowledge and information of how to adjust the land to make it habitable um, and to make it grow things. Um, and then Norway's got one of the biggest seed banks, etc. And you can just imagine the accumulation of all these different seeds. They've, they've got it under the ice, these massive, massive storage rooms of, of, of that. And, and, you know, like Norway is also very interesting from the point of view. It's one of the only countries that is, that is, um, uh, doesn't have any debt. No debt. Imagine a country with no debt. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, this whole unity thing is really getting to me. When I go outside, I'm really respecting the tree and respecting the, the ground and not because it's some we will woo woo um sixties type thing. It's just because it's it just feels good to me and I feel good about it. <laughs> you know, and it's just it's just feeling I feel more balanced and connected and all the rest of it. So yeah, it, the, the the connecting is probably the biggest thing that's hitting me like an absolute ton of bricks at the moment, how we all 
connected. We're all connected. You know, what happens in one part of the world at the moment affects the other one drastically. Yeah, um, that's right. And, uh, and, and I can't just see it at this, in, in terms of just human groups anymore. It seems to be so much more vast. And especially when you start touching, when you start leaving your body and you have all these inner experiences, et cetera, you start really understanding how everything is connected in every way, especially in the physical universe. Um, and, you know, it's so special that, that, that connection. It's just so incredibly special. Um, and we really, I, I'm learning to have respect for all the different layers of connectivity, specifically the ones that relate to me creating a physical body and sustaining it. Um, there, you know, there's in one teaspoon of, of soil, there's billions of microbes, etc. Um, and we've only studied one or two percent of them. So there's, there's so much life that we, we don't even know about and it's just gargantuous. So I'm really, really enjoying all, all the different uh, things that are happening uh, around me at the moment. It is, it is really a journey, as somebody said to me once. Um, it, it's a journey and you, you go along this journey in your own way, in your own time and you, you respect everybody else for doing their journey their way and, you know, off you go. And, and, um, I'm just finding there's a lot of people who, because I've got such a broad uh, outlook on so many different things, I'm finding so many people I'm bonding with, little groups, you know. I, I'm a naturist as well at the moment, and I've found a whole new family there. And uh, <laughs> can you run into the soil and you've got a whole new family there? Then you've got, um, you know, something like Rotary and you've got a whole new family there. And um, just just goes on and on and on where you know, you're connecting with everybody else and everybody's doing the little bit. And, you know, even in Rotary, I'm seeing there's lots of things I don't want to do, so I don't do them. And people stand, you know. Somebody asked me in, in the middle of a meeting, they said to me, well, don't you want to be Father Christmas? I said, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I said, and I was wondering why I immediately did that. And I got my back hairs up. First of all, they're putting pressure on you because they're doing it in the middle of a meeting. <laughs> And if anybody puts pressure on me, I just, my back hairs get up. <laughs> and, and I realize, you know, if you'd asked me beforehand, I could check with my wife in the diary, I'd be able to probably say yes. But no, you put pressure on me and put an ask me in the middle of a meeting. <laughs> no. <laughs> not the best strategy with Louis de Souza, no. <laughs> no, not the best strategy with me. Somebody said to me, why? And somebody else said, leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> they know, they know you well. <laughs> they know me. <laughs> Starting to. <laughs> That's the thing though, isn't it? It's finding your passion and finding those people who you can enjoy your passion with and mm. just bonding. And it does, that just lifts you because if you find your tribe, then you just feel like you're going through it with other people. It just lifts your spirit. But you're, it, we all know it's a vibrational thing. We're just picking up on each other's vibration yeah. and all pulling ourselves up. Um, but like you say, it, that goes down to knowing you, knowing what your passions are. Well, and there's a chapter on risk taking, for instance. And for, for some people, it feels like a big risk to embrace their passions. And so, um, you know, I, I always say I'm not talking about just jump, jumping off a cliff without a parachute, right? It, like take graded steps, build slowly up. Start by taking a class in something that has always interested you or that maybe once interested you and you let go at one point in your life. Louis, you have certainly found your passions. It's amazing to hear you talk about those things. You're, you, you just come alive. And that's the, the level of passion that I'm talking about. Absolutely. And through following passions, you do find your tribe, right? When you embrace them, then you find people with similar interests. And then you learn about yourself, like, like they're all interdependent, you know, and symbiotic as well. Yeah, I think, I think the big lesson that I've really learned is not tribe. I like to put an S at the back of that. Yeah, plural. Yeah. You, right. you, know, you really don't have to restrict yourself to one tribe. You really mm -hmm. don't. True. <laughs> In fact, no, if you restrict yourself to one tribe, what you really do is you restrict yourself. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think of how many tribes. I've got the family of the LOA tribe. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something to be said for um, exploring all of the tribes because what we're really saying when we say that is we're, we're exploring all of our own passions. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're saying, you know, I'm not limited to just one passion. It's not like, oh, that's all you get for your life. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> Next. No, no. You get to you get to have as many passions as you want. Yeah. Well, well how many times has somebody said to you, do you want this or that? Uh, They've given you only two I, options, and I get so annoyed <laughs> if anybody ever does that to me. <laughs> <laughs> There's more than two, mate. <laughs> I, I remember the first time I actually challenged that. I was in my 20s, and I – I don't remember exactly how I challenged it. I think it was something like, why am I limited to two? And it was at a time where that kind of breakthrough thinking was certainly not going on in any of the circles I was involved in. So I, I flummoxed the person who said it to me. Like, mm-hmm. they, like no, 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 you're, you're only allowed two choices. <laughs> I said, but I take more than two. He said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, yeah, watch me. <laughs> It was a big deal at that point. I mean, today it's gotten to the point where people are much more open to a whole wide range of things. But there was a time where you just you had to go with the program. That was it. No third option. Sorry. Next. <laughs> Good. If somebody's you, determined why? to only give me two options, I say I'll choose the third, which is none none, none of the two. <laughs> none of the two, right? <laughs> well, I'd like to tell you about. My conversation sparks, if that's okay. Sure. Um, sure. So I was going out uh, doing public speaking gigs when my book first came out. And um, I would take them through uh, basically what I took you all through, how I came to write the book and the, the main themes of it. And I would do a standard, you know, reading portion of a chapter or two. And I would wrap up my talks by saying, I hope I have inspired you to connect more deeply with yourselves, with others, with your passions. And uh, what would you imagine people would do based on that? A 45 minute or one hour talk. Yeah, like Walt, look at Walt's face. Walt's like, oh, I don't know. People, would, <laughs> they didn't have a clue how to do it. So I realized I needed to remind or in some cases teach people how to connect more deeply. And I, so I very quickly altered my public speaking talks into more experiential activities where I lead them through um, a process in which they connect more deeply with themselves or others. And from that, this product was born. So I, the process is I offer a conversation starter, you know, an open-ended question, um, and then teach people or remind them how to listen actively and feedback. So splitting people into dyads, two people, where one is the listener and reminding them how to listen really actively, specifically for themes and values. And the, I give a conversation prompt to, to the speaker and have the listener feedback after two minutes what they heard as the person's themes or values. And notice as they're doing this whole activity how connected they feel with themselves and with the other person. And um, often people would pair up with strangers. Sometimes it might be with a spouse or a family member. And and people would be brought to tears in you know five minutes through this activity and a, an explicit opportunity to listen really deeply, to be heard and, mm-hmm. and to know they have been heard and to hear can be so moving for people. And so then I kind of put that whole experience in a box. So this includes instructions for active listening and um, 102 conversation starters based on all those themes in my book. So this so, is so these, full, what, these, these like cards? What, what's, what's the Yes, philosophy? yes, exactly. It's the mm-hmm. full heart living conversation sparks. And yes, cards okay. with just, just one statement. Uh, right. and you can pick one at random. And if, if you want to just use it like for journal writing, people do that. Or if you want to do it in a small group or often people will do it in a, in a, um, sometimes in dyads, but I've seen it done often in, you know, groups of say four or five or six people. But and what's really cool, I've done it with my son and his friends. Um, so, uh, young adult boys or men, 
Um, and it's, it's really good. You, you know, you, we have all kinds of stereotypes, right? About young adult men, how, how limited they can be, how, um, self-centered they can be. And who, who, of us, who amongst us can't be both of those, you know, depending on the circumstances. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. God, I, um, the, the, the one thing I've learned about uh, any kind of generalization about a generation is that it's usually wrong. I don't care what generation you're talking about. You know, it, it applies to a little tiny subset and yeah. somebody has generalized it to apply to the entire generation. And the, the thought that goes from my mind whenever I hear one of those is, yeah, how many of them have you met? Uh, <laughs> I mean, right. there's a lot of people in that generation. Yes. Good question. Yeah. I also like the, the, the idea of your cards. I, because what your cards are really doing is they are asking people to focus attention on something that in today's society, we really don't spend a lot of time on Mm -hmm. listening Mm -hmm. and expressing. Mm -hmm. And, and it it seems so odd to say that we live in the, in, in the era of social media, lots of expression going on, right? Mm -hmm. But very little of it is one-to-one. Correct. Mm -hmm. And you're basically, you're you're reseeding to borrow from Louis uh, soil analogy. You're reseeding the idea that the one-to-one connection is the vital one. Yes, it is. It is vital. Mm-hmm. In fact, you're also taking it to to the point where people are kind of reintroducing themselves to it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because it, they they haven't been engaging in it on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of why people are moved to tears so quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's um I- it's a skill almost that that needs to be redeveloped. Mm-hmm. Yes. So sad and true. Go ahead, mm-hmm. Anne-Marie. No, I was just saying, I, I, I can see that in sort of other areas where there's, there's people who just don't know about teamwork because they've been so isolated or isolated themselves that they don't actually know how to interact and work together with other people. So if you're in the work environment, that's quite restricting and quite lonely and not a very happy environment. So it's good that these cards can reintroduce these skills and train people and give them a starting point. Because sometimes if, you, if you're not used to doing it, then you don't know where to start, do you? You don't know what to ask. You don't know if you're exactly. being intrusive. You, it's, it's, it's quite nice to see. Exactly. This gives permission and a structure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yes, exactly. And how has it been received? Like I say, um, people are moved to tears very quickly. It's, it's just phenomenal and so rewarding to be a part of. So very, very, very positively. When they give you feedback on why they were moved to tears, what do they say? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a, kind of like you all have just been saying. It's like it's been so long since I've had an experience like that. And I can't believe... And it can go two ways. Again, I said, sometimes people are paired with a stranger and then that, that in a few minutes you could see me so clearly, so deeply people get moved by that. And, and I've had this experience. I've done them with my husband. And so we've been together almost 30 years, you know, even me going into it, I assumed I knew what he would say. And I assumed I knew how this experience would go. And I was wrong. I was so wrong even the person I know the best on the planet and have lived with all these years, I, I had no idea that he had certain things to say and that, and to have him listen deeply and reflect me in this way. Again, we talk every single day and we have a great relationship, uh, but to slow down and, and have him really hear me and tell me he hears me. Oh my gosh. It just, it means the world. I'm reminded of a, a segment, a, a scene from a movie that came out a few years ago. Uh, the star in this particular case was Susan Sarandon. And Sarandon's character in the scene gives the opinion that the, the primary reason why people pair up, why they uh, develop primary relationships, is to witness each other's lives. Mm. And what you're talking about here is a very in-depth form of witnessing. Yes. Isn't that true? Yeah, I like that. Because it's there's a lot of truth in it, that witnessing aspect. Um, you know, people love to be seen. We all know that. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, when somebody's truly seeing you, you really feel witnessed. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we need to be on both sides of the equation, right? It's not just being, it's not just witnessing the other, it's being witnessed, right? It's like we both. really, we have to have both for optimal thriving. Which makes sense. I mean, if we're all going to be connected like we are, if we're all uh, source connected, then yeah, you have to have both. It's not communication if you're not both giving and receiving the information. Right. It it can't be one directional. Uh Well, it can for a short time, but it's going to fail after a while. Yeah, there's give and take and there's times I need to be the witness and times I need to be more the witnessed. (laughs) <laughs> but if it's but if it's unidirectional, if it's only one direction and it stays just unidirectional, that that's a connection that's going to deteriorate. It's not sustainable. Yeah. And someone's making somebody's, that point right now. <laughs> I was gonna say, <laughs> so somebody's I was dog wants you, to communicate. Hopefully, you weren't hearing the dog, but obviously you were. Yes. <laughs> Rex, or the dog is very happy to connect with Greg, who's just come home. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, there's, that, that's a brilliant example of connection, isn't it? Pets it and is. animals. It doesn't yeah. have to be the same species, as Louis said. Correct. That connection between pets is just, well, they, mm. they become your family, don't they? Mm-hmm. I love my worms. <laughs> <laughs> have you named all 3,000 of them? <laughs> yeah, that'd be quite a trick, actually, to keep track of all the names of the worms. Like, wow. Mm. You'd have to have well, a database for that. <laughs> Louie or others, have you heard the spider study? Um, there were, they've, they studied three spiders. Um, I'm not going to be able to name the source of this, but I do remember distinctly hearing about it. And uh, one spider would, would like leave the, um, not the nest, what do they call it? The web, you know, one was more adventurous. One stayed to the center of the web way more they notice these behavioral differences and one was kind of a combination of two so even individual spiders have tendencies per, per, and why not even call them personalities right those are like personality types oh, right yeah. there <laughs> so i assume i bet if you got to know how even a handful of your worms right you could in time you probably would recognize one would have a spot here one would have a spot there one would be different size Right? Absolutely. They're individual. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's so many dimensions to this, but there is a theory that we evolve from minerals to, to plants to animal to pets or animals that are close to humans and then to humans. Um, if any of that's true, um, you kind of think, you know, th- there's a level of individuality all over the place. Mm. Mm. And, yeah, anyone who's um, ever had a pet knows that. Mm-hmm. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Um, our cat, this was, was an next door neighbor's cat, and he he was uh, being looked after by them because the owner's thick, the cousin of the next door neighbor went to make a movie in New Zealand. but So they left the cat there, and then the cat didn't like their cat, so the cat came and lived with us. Because we got a cat flap, and he moved in, and he started taking over the house and <laughs> and, and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, they were feeding him next door, and we had him here, so we thought, oh, that's a good deal. We get the cat, <laughs> and they get to feed him. <laughs> and, uh, well, basically, he just took up home completely, and, and eventually... The, the owners said, you know, do you want to keep him? And we said, yes, yeah, sure. And, um, and, and we landed up with a cat. Now I was against any animals. Um, so was my wife, basically, because we travel so much. Um, but my, my kids really, really wanted them. So the universe found a way of <laughs> making all these different com, com, confusing and conflicting, uh, parameters work. And it's a, such an easy cat. We can go on holiday and the next door neighbor comes and feeds them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's really interesting. And he's so individualistic. And like, you know, he's very territorial and he's got his own way in so many different respects. Um, when we went away on our first holiday, he was so traumatized. 
totally traumatized. That mm. he, so he went away because he's he's been he, he was a rescue cat before the, the previous owners got him. So he's been thrown from pillar to post, and right. now every time we go on holiday, we make sure we're definitely coming back. Just a couple of weeks, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Then we had we've never had another day's problem. You know, um, no matter how long we go away for, even if it's three weeks, the cat's absolutely fine. It knows now. Because we put out that message, so you know, that commun- that inner communication is so possible. Uh, it doesn't matter what worm it is. <laughs> Good worm. <word. laughs> <laughs> Tom, your story reminded me of a conversation I had with my six-year-old um, earlier. She came into my office when she finished with school. I was still working, and she was like, "Mummy, there's a spider on your ceiling," and she was like, "We're getting a bit scared." And I don't like spiders, but they don't know that. Um, and I was like, yeah, it's okay. That's my friend. And I was like, that's Horace. And he's living there. And she's like, have you been talking to him? I was like, yeah, he's just keeping me company. And obviously that took away the fear of the spider because mm. I felt like I'd, do you know what I mean? So nice. it, that's just a really oh. big, just a silly way of sort of how that connection can take away another emotion. Or I've always told not, my, not my take daughters. away. Yeah. Sorry. I've always told my daughters that the spiders are my friends. And, Dad, one of your friends are here. Get him out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they got part of the message. That's good. You know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think Anne-Marie did it better than I did. <laughs> Let's just say they're working on the other half. That's all. You know, one step at a time. That's the way these things work, right? You know, we, we, we would ideally love to have a world where everybody's perfectly connected and so forth. But in reality, it's messy. It's a messy mm. world we live in. And when you live in a messy world, messy things happen. So the way I like to look at it is, <clears throat> yeah, there's a mess, but is it getting cleaned up? Is it improving? Is it getting worse? Mm-hmm. Is anybody paying attention to it? Mm-hmm. Is there still a mess? <laughs> Give me some details. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever you're seeing there, what can you find in it that's actually improving? Yeah. Well, well, my daughter must have been listening upstairs because she's just sent me two two photos of the cat. (laughs) 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 So thank you, Isabel, for your contribution. (laughs) That's fabulous. (laughs) I like to ask the question of of a of a mess. Like, what's the message? What's what's the lesson here? Or you know, what am I called to do about the mess? Mm. Yeah, what's the message in the mess? What's the mess in the message? Yes. Mm-hmm. Whoa. And are we going to engage with the mess mm-hmm. or create and create our own stability? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, we always have that choice, don't we? Mm-hmm. Can you create stability when you're focused on the mess? Not directly, but when, mm-hmm. when you recognize that the mess is an opportunity to refocus, then you can. Mm-hmm. Once you've focused on where you want to be, mm-hmm. yeah. then you can start getting where you want. But if yeah. you're still focused on the mess, you're going nowhere. You're going to amplify it and it's going to get worse. Well, tell me, tell me what you think about this then, because this is what I do so often with clients is we start with the mess. What do you know about the, it? It is those curiosity questions. What are you noticing? What's coming up? Where is it, if it's, you know, an emotion, where is it in your body? And and from the curiosity, often, like the kernel of, of where we want to go arises. Like, like the, the, the solution already exists in the mess itself. Sure. Mm-hmm. I think it's changing the perception, isn't it? It's changing the perception of what the mess is your relationship to what that mess is yeah. and using that into something that you can use positively yeah. in your life or learn and grow from. Right. So Tom, you've got 14 seconds. 14 <laughs> seconds. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no pressure. You no use pressure. it wisely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you understand the law of attraction, if you focus on something more than 14 seconds, you amplify it. <clears throat> So if you're spending more than 14 seconds focusing on somebody's problems, yes. mess, then you're amplifying it. Yeah. Yeah. And the universal law of attraction, if you spend one minute on it, will bring 2,000 man hours of work into amplifying that. 
so I think, you know, from my own perspective, I really, I really wanted uh, to, to be very clear that when I know what I don't want, um, I, I take that as an expansion point and I don't look at it as negative anymore. And I really start immediately my mind stringing. Okay. I know what I don't want. What do I want? Oh, okay. I don't like the cat there. Let's do this to make them not there anymore. <laughs> and oh, that feels much better because the cat won't be there anymore. Um, my cat loves taking my seat every time I want to put my shoes on. He's on my seat. <laughs> 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 They're very good at that. Yeah. Um, Louis, so, you're denying yeah. him that connection to you. <laughs> <laughs> You can sit in my lap, but not on my seat. <laughs> <laughs> but he I'm, learns, you know, he learns very quickly. Um, it doesn't take much to, to get him not to repeat something again and again. Um, and, you know, I just wish, you know, sometimes I was quicker to, to, to shift, but, you know, like today was a really frustrating day. It was well heard. It's like, <clears throat> I've like never heard so Louis utter so much sound of frustration. <laughs> I, seriously, it was it was record breaking. Um, but you know, uh, sometimes it just uh, it, it it it's it's all about trying to to pivot quicker. And the quicker you can pivot, the nicer, happier, easier life is. And uh, you know, we all have our tougher days. But, you know, I really think that I've worked on pivoting much quicker than most, um, or at least what I was like in the past. I don't like comparing myself to others. <laughs> okay. um, but, you know, over the years, understanding the law of attraction, understanding that these expansion points exist, actually loving and appreciating them quicker <laughs> um, is has been very, very beneficial. And, you know, well, people I think can also... really get that. I think it's also a, a, an indication that for anyone who's dealing with, you know, the, these negative expansion points as you were describing them and find that they can't, they can't seem to get their mind off of them. They can't seem to pivot away. They can't seem to make that shift. It, it's, I think, reassuring to know that the more we practice it, we actually do get better at it mm. because early on it can feel you can so definitely get better. Yeah. Definitely. It takes practice. You have to put mm. a little effort in. You have to put a little, mm. you know, l- little intention like, okay, I may not like what I'm having to do right now, but I'm going to do it anyway. But if you can put the work in, it pays off. I know when I first I like, started I like to... to try... What was it? Sorry, when, when I first um, started to like work on that, I used to journal and then I would just use... I'd ha- if I'd had a bad day, I would just like pick out all the things that I did appreciate about that day. And mm. then it changes your perception about the day. Actually, it wasn't as bad because you're not focusing yeah. on what's going wrong you're focusing on actually this went right and i found that a really good tool for me totally agree mm. yeah what was that louis um you know you're talking about practice or routine which is really the way i like looking at it. it's just an active vibration mm-hmm. You get yep. good active vibrations and you get bad ones and you want to try increasing the good active vibrations. The more you practice them, the more active they become. So that when the day comes where you go, mm, and you got that mm, vibration, mm. Going, <laughs> you, can, you can climb out. <laughs> well, I appreciate this 14 second rule. Um, uh, part of have my... you ever heard of it? Well, I'm curious. No, I have not. Oh, um, okay. Uh, I think part of why I was asking the question is that, um, you know, there's so much denial and hap- less happy people deny more and they try to suppress and avoid anything negative. And so part of the work is, is, is to, uh, help them not do that because it, then it just gets stuffed, right? right? It gets worse and it goes underground and it comes out some other way. Mm-hmm. So, so let's get some flow. Right. So acknowledge, but I like to limit, I like this idea of limiting it more. Uh, in 14 seconds, that is not a lot of time. So, so. Yeah, but there, there's, there, there's another aspect to it that one really needs to be clear about. Very few people can focus on one subject for 14 seconds. Mm. Without interruption, yeah. Mm. So mm. people aren't harming themselves that much because 
they they thinking, oh, it's a really shitty day or whatever. Oh, but I want to I want to have some food. Uh, what am I yeah. going to cook for food? So so that's so so the mind is changing a lot. So when I say fourteen okay. seconds, I'm talking about focused yeah. concentration on one subject for that period of time. Yeah, and that's that aspect is important to understand when you're talking about the fourteen second rule. Yes, because oh, what that, that really means, what it adds up to, is it gives us a lot of grace period. Mm-hmm. On the one hand, it doesn't seem like a very long period of time. On the right. other hand, it's actually quite long. So right. we get, we can we can screw up quite a bit and still not screw up all that bad. <laughs> but on the other side is if you really learn to focus on one thing for 14 seconds, what you cannot achieve is almost non-existent. Mm. True. And that, that's the one that takes the longest mm. to internalize. But mm. when you do start to internalize it, that's when you start to feel your power. And then, of course, Abram Hicks says it's easier to teach humans to still the mind than it is to teach a human to focus on positivity of what they want. Mm. Very true. And that also creates a very interesting clarity. It really does. Hey Tom, this has been a, a fun conversation. I'm just realizing yeah. we need we need to make sure we uh, uh, let people know how to find Tom Glazer and how to Please. find your book. You know, the full full heart living book. I mean, that's an important title all by itself. Tell, tell oh. us a little bit more about how to reach out to you, from how to find your stuff, how to find the cards. Absolutely, best way is full heart living. H e a r t. Dot com, fullheartliving.com. There's a, a link to buy the book and Full Heart Living Conversation Sparks. There's um, a free workbook. So all the chapters end with workbook activities. And I distilled all those down into this free download that people can get on my website. And I'm um, on uh, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram as well. So those are places to reach out to. And if if somebody's actually listening in who thinks that you might be the person they need to talk to 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 work through some of their own stuff, are those the best ways to reach out to you? That works absolutely. All right. So I just wanted sure. to say hi to Sam and Luke. <laughs> hey guys, nice to have hi you guys, guys listening in the live stream. And uh, I also want to uh, thank you, Tom, for taking the time and and sharing your insights and your, your happiness quotient ideas. Pleasure. (laughs) Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a delight. I also like to make sure uh, to make it a point to thank our guests in in a different way too, that normally doesn't get done because all the people who have appeared on this show and who do the kind of work that you and others do constantly reaching out, helping other people and so forth. Everybody who, who does anything like this, has many people that they've talked to through podcasts and books and articles and all kinds of stuff um, that they'll never meet, they'll never see, they'll never they'll, they'll never find out directly how they impacted on them, but they impacted them, they helped them in, in ways. And I, I think we need to recognize that more. So on behalf of the people you've never met, whom you've never seen, who you've been able to impact in a positive way, thank you for the help that you've given to them over the Aww. years and for the help you continue to give. Thank you, Walt. That's really kind. I appreciate that. <laughs> I, I think it's important. I think we we need to recognize, especially in this era, this 21st century, where mm-hmm. we're all doing all this interaction online mm-hmm. through Zoom and social media and all this other stuff, that we do have a positive impact on people we've never seen and that we need to be appreciated for that. Right. Because when, we, when we're appreciated, then we can also appreciate ourselves. That's true. Yes. And obviously you all are doing that as well. So I will just reflect the same thing back at all of you and the listeners as well, right? They Absolutely. This, like this is everyone. This is all of us. It's all of us together. Yep. That's right. Every single one of us. We're all in this together one way or another. We're all connected. Back we to are. Our <laughs> we are indeed. So thank you guys very much. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. And we will see you all next time here on LOA today. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 